This video is brought to you by Vessi. Eight Crazy Nights, a movie that I both love and hate at the exact same time. On one hand, this film has some fantastic animation that is genuinely wonderful to behold. Good character designs, fluid movement, hell, even some of the songs are pretty damn catchy. We even have some heartfelt moments that get me all teary-eyed. Uh, no, I don't want to watch this little old man have his delicate heart ripped out because he realized that nobody in this town cares about his well-being or sacrifices. St stop it, Adam Sandler movie! You can't do that to me! Oh wait, an Adam Sandler movie. Well, I suppose y'all might be able to guess why I dislike this movie too, because... <laughs> yeah. You go from something that resembles a sincere holiday movie to dear hysterically defecating. How is it an actual sentence I uttered? Yeah, that was weird, wasn't it? Being the masochist that I am, I watch this movie every year, fooling myself into thinking that, hey, this time it won't be so bad. Maybe my perspective has changed, and I keep disappointing myself over and over again. Why do I do it? Why is this movie so alluring, yet so disgusting at the exact same time? What does it do right? And what does it do wrong? And what is the story behind its creation? Because I found out there was some drama in this production. I didn't do it for you. I did it for the ladies. <laughs> yeah, right. But real quick, I want to give a shout out to this video sponsor, Vessi. Folks, my shoe collection is basically all Vessi. Look at that right there. It's, just, it's it's a lot. I got the boardwalk slip-ons. I got the weekend sneakers. I got the Soho sneakers. And I'm also rocking the Ulta high tops too. Yes, I have a problem, but at least it's a stylish and comfortable problem. For those who don't know, Vessi makes awesome shoes that are waterproof and durable. Take them on a hike. Take them on a plane. Hell, take them out of a plane. Look at me flying through the sky with my Vessies. Wee, I'm falling to my death. Woo! As of late, I've been rocking the Ulta high tops. Look at how stylish they are. Look at the texture. Yeah, look at it. It has a synthetic leather exterior that looks sleek yet casual and a padded collar that provides extra comfort to your ankles. Plus, just like other Vessie shoes, the Ulta high tops rock Dymatex technology, which means your shoe is breathable yet waterproof too. Also, Vessi has launched their own waterproof gloves. They're stretchy, insulated with a warm lining, and 100% super waterproof. Whatever the day throws at you, you'll be warm and dry no matter what. I don't fear rainy days anymore. The rainy day fears me. So I highly recommend Vessi's. They're my go-to shoes by the door. And now even gloves too. Hit up the description down below and go to Vessi.com slash Saberspark to get 15% off your order. Go hit him up today. All right, back to the video. Also, like, comment, and subscribe for future uploads. Ugh, this is embarrassing. So before making it big on SNL, Adam Stanley grew up in Manchester, New Hampshire, after moving there from Brooklyn, New York at the age of six. So it only seems fitting that the film opens in Dukesbury, New Hampshire, a cute but industrious town looking like it came straight off a holiday postcard. Right off the bat, there is a gorgeous amount of attention to detail shown in backgrounds, featuring the lush surrounding forest and a diner Sandler's family used to visit called the Red Arrow Diner. Now I can appreciate little touches like that, but what's the movie about? Well, the story follows 33-year-old Davy Stone, the local drunken screw-up who hates the holidays with a passion. He spends the majority of December terrorizing everyone else in town, evading cops, assaulting strangers, and destroying as much public property as he can. You know, a festive stuff like that. Notably, Davy starts singing about the havoc he wreaks during the first song of the movie. Because yes, this movie is, as a matter of fact, a musical. I can only describe it as a, man, what's the opposite of a I want song in musicals? Uh, I guess a I suck song? Yeah, let's go with that. While you're singing your holiday tune, I'm acting like the town before, whipping out my big white scary moon, and blowing up your way. 
Look out, Elton John. Adam Sandler's coming for that best original song Oscar. Aside from the yikes-inducing lyrics, I'm mostly surprised Davy has not gotten, like, beaten up regularly for acting like such a jackass in public. But this time, it is the last straw. After one too many run-ins with the cops, Davy is put on trial and nearly sentenced to 10 years in the state prison. Suddenly, a short Keebler elf-looking fella named Whitey Duval offers to make a deal with the judge. He will supervise Davey doing community service as a referee for the local youth basketball program, but only on one condition. If Davey breaks the law at any point during that time, the deal is off, and he'll immediately be sent to jail. Whitey is framed as the eternal optimist, always wanting to see the good in people and doing his best to be a positive, supportive member of the community. Davy is reluctant, but sucks it up. Because hey, uh, dealing with a 69-year-old weirdo has to be better than jail, right? It would be if Davy didn't have such a massive chip on his shoulder. Surprising absolutely no one, Davy has a lot of repressed personal issues and anger problems but he's become intensely antisocial because of them. Instead, when frustrated, Davy lashes out at everyone and anything. Although he's forced to stick around Whitey by a court order, that doesn't stop Davy from insulting him every chance he gets. Whitey tries to turn the other cheek and keeps moving on, but after a while, the constant bullying does start to get to him. In fact, the whole movie treats him like garbage. Even the narrator, voiced by Rob Schneider, dunks on Whitey, which adds such an unnecessary mean-spirited vibe to everything. Of course Whitey wouldn't understand what getting flipped off means. He's so behind the times, he thinks Viagra is a big waterfall. <laughs> hey, Rob, uh, is this you, pal? He just a no good Nick, and I am the real Koriste Yamaguchi. Yeah. Anyway, on its face, Whitey is supposed to be the emotional anchor of the movie. His entire motivation is to win an award called the 35th Annual All-Star Patch. It's framed as the town's highest honor and a token of appreciation for exceptional individuals, meaning a person who works tirelessly to help Dukesbury become a better place. Whitey has a kind heart and has been volunteering as a referee for the youth basketball team for 35 years. So yeah, I can understand why he won a little appreciation for devoting so much of his own time towards helping others. Where things get gross is how directly the movie frames why we should look down on Whitey and laugh at him. I'm not kidding, that's like 80% of the movie. He's got a gratingly high-pitched voice, has seizures when he's stressed out, struggles to walk properly, is seemingly illiterate, and lives with his twin sister, Eleanor. She doesn't do much better either. Eleanor is a germaphobe, paranoid of strangers, pudgy, wears ill-fitting wigs to cover up that she's bald, and has a harsh, nasally voice based on Adam Sandler's real-life aunt. But why the heck would they shop this thick in here? I'm getting exhausted trying to cut around The voice of Eleanor is, um... My Aunt uh, Sarah. They just keep piling it on, wanting to give the audience more reasons to judge them. But it doesn't build any sympathy for either of them as characters. The movie treats Whitey and Eleanor like walking, talking freak shows. Now, maybe I'm just in my uptight boomer era, but that's not funny to me. And frankly, I don't think it ever has been. Whitey specifically comes across as dangerously naive, especially given how old he is. Admittedly, the biggest problem I have with him as a character is his bizarre love affair with going to the mall. Whitey actually gets into a poetic monologue about how much he loves being there, which I think is intended to be funny, I guess? But it mostly comes across as terribly depressing. I mean, the body shop, the thigh rack, GNC, Radio Shack, Petland for a catapult, Spencer's kiss for some fake dog do. Now, if I wanted to be charitable, I'd say it's almost like he's using the mall and shameless consumerism to fill an emptiness inside of him. Kind of like with No Face from Spirited Away. Oh my god, I just compared an Adam Sandler movie to a Ghibli film. But who am I kidding? It's just a dumb, happy Madison film. It's probably very surface level. Gratuitous product placement is a constant and common trope in Adam Sandler movies. But to make it this obtrusive is so cringeworthy. That's gonna come up again later too, only so much worse. You've been warned. 
Throughout the film, the only people who show Whitey any kind of consideration are Eleanor, Davy's childhood crush Jennifer, and her son Benjamin. The whole town of Dukesbury is just as much of a character as our lead trio, but it's also a village full of haters and mean-spirited jerks. And while watching the movie, I couldn't for the life of me figure out why Whitey would be chasing after the validation of a bunch of jerks who actively take advantage of him. Ooh, ah, ooh, ooh. Well, will you look at that? It's a jackass in the box. But by far, the toughest nut for Whitey to crack is Davy, who continues to dump on him, uh, figuratively and uh, <laughs> literally. Seriously, who would root for any character this abusive and cruel? But Whitey does not give up, as he actually used to know Davy as a kid. He was the star basketball player for his youth league, but abruptly stopped playing 21 years ago. Gee, I wonder what happened. Uh, despite this, Davy is still bitter and insists he can play, but only once his pride is threatened by a rival team. The game starts, and it's honestly hilarious to see that they use some like pretty generous creative license with making Davy a super awesome and shredded role model on the basketball court, despite, you know, being a 33-year-old alcoholic. Adam Sandler actually describes the reason for this visual decision during a making of interview with Hollywood.com. I watched myself over the years in the movies, getting progressively uh, older and uglier. And so animation uh, gave us the right to use the youthful Sandler, the body I had when I was a 19 year old and I was built like a stallion. Oh wow, uh, how inspirational. Turns out you can really use the magic of animation to make the most impossible dreams a reality. Whee! Davy and Benjamin end up winning the game, leading to a guy on the other team having to eat like this obese man's jockstrap? Yes, that happens. In retaliation, the same guy burns down Davy's trailer, because that's what you do if you lose a game. With no time to spare, he quickly rescues an unopened card from his parents, but loses everything else in the wreckage. With nowhere to go, Davy moves in with Whitey and Eleanor, who set some ground rules to keep him in line. The instrumentation for Technical Foul is honestly really jazzy and fun, but it's drowned out by the screechings of the three characters who have no business singing. If I make fun of your crazy feeties, or give sugar cookies to Miss Diabetes. That's not only a technical yeah! Gradually, Davy starts to tolerate living with Whitey and Eleanor, even enjoying helping out around the house and joking around with them. But things take a turn for the worse when a trip to the local ice skating rink goes wrong. Now, I'm gonna get into this scene a bit more than I usually would, because this is supposed to be the second act crisis of the film. But I'm gonna expand on it because I want to make it clear how awful and insulting this segment is, okay? All right, so at the ice skating rink, Eleanor asks why Davy stopped playing basketball if he was such a talented player, but he doesn't want to get into it. Whitey reveals that Davy's sad backstory is his parents dying in a car accident on the way to the big game, which just so happened to take place during Hanukkah. So, okay, fine, that makes sense. He hates this time of year because it dredges up uncomfortable memories that Davy's not ready to handle yet. But it's an awkward scene, and honestly, Whitey's kind of a dick for bringing it up, let alone continuing the story when Davy politely asked them to stop several times. It doesn't excuse his self-medicating with alcohol or being rude to everyone, but it's some much needed context to understand why we should care about him. Losing one parent is traumatic enough, but two and the same night when you're only 12 years old? Yeah, maybe hold off on bringing that up, my dude. Even if he's trying to like empathize with Davy, this kind of interaction could make him relapse if he's not ready to talk about it. Davy set a boundary with Whitey, who willfully ignored it multiple times. And Davy lashed out when he was fed up. Like, I don't want to defend Davy here because he's clearly being hostile and defensive when his traumatic past is brought up. But as cruel as this conversation is, it wasn't Whitey's story to tell. And he explained it anyway. I think this scene could have worked out a lot better as a follow-up to Jennifer picking up Benjamin after the basketball challenge scene. Like a short but important conversation in the car, or unwrapping Hanukkah gifts about how torn up she is about having him around Davy. 
They have a history together, being childhood crushes, and Jennifer knows why he's acting like that, but she's obviously not comfortable around him due to his drunken outburst and unresolved issues. They could have repurposed the locker room scene of them talking as kids and make their connection feel more genuine. Now, it's not a massive change, but at the very least, it gives them something to do. Plus, it's a reason to want Davey and Jennifer to reconnect at the end. Stuff like that. Just give us something. It's so weird for the script to actually try to put in a message about repressing emotions. Because Adam Sandler doesn't really do message movies. At least not in an impactful kind of way. Their writing is so transparent and obvious that it always comes across as manipulative. So this feels like that deliberate, we're having a fight to draw up the tension before the climax kind of thing. Whitey's motivation is kind of dumb if he's only doing it for the recognition of a town who doesn't respect or treat him well. To me, I'd hope that after 35 years of service, Whitey would find some other form of personal satisfaction in his work, or at the very least, to not be so reliant on the approval of other people who shouldn't matter to him. If you keep living life as a people pleaser, your happiness and self-esteem will be dependent on how everybody else sees you. Ultimately, it's a losing game and an unhealthy defense mechanism, which the movie completely shies away from addressing. So Whitey's incessant need to help out for essentially nothing in return isn't truly altruistic. It's the desperation of a lonely and anxious old man who's deluding himself into thinking he's respected in the community. That to him, by getting that award, he'll finally be seen as being worth something in the eyes of everyone else. Holy sh what a horrible message to put into a film. Look, I'm just saying, if they really wanted to expand on that in a meaningful way, then the message is totally lost by making fun of him the whole time. And I know this script had four writers, including Adam Sandler, which is a massive red flag in itself. But if you're going to write an edgy holiday comedy film, at least pretend like you respect the characters so we have somebody to root for. Okay, rant over. After this exchange, Davy angrily parts ways with Eleanor and Whitey. While they're getting ready for the banquet, Davy is at an all-time low. He gets plastered and breaks into the mall, experiencing an honest-to-God intervention from store mascots. Davy's emotional arc as a character is dependent on these advertising characters acting as his conscience, featuring brands who allegedly weren't actually paid to be included in this film at least based on an interview with the director, Seth Kearsley reported. A big misconception with the movie is that we had all kinds of money from the brands, but it wasn't the case. I wanted to have real stores because it was taking place in present day, and I hate the cliche store names that you will see in other animated movies. Basically, we got a list of brands that were fine being in the movie, and we added those brands for authenticity." End quote. The mascots demand he finally grieves over the loss of his parents by reading the card they left for him as a child. Davey breaks down crying and evades the cops, narrowly escaping onto a bus headed for New York City. But the magic of Hanukkah, or whatever, who cares, we're almost done, stops the bus by popping all the tires using a single thumbtack. Stranded, Davey checks in on Whitey at the banquet dinner, knowing he owes him an apology. However, Whitey does not end up winning the patch. Who would have guessed? It just goes to some guy played by John Lovitz, who bought a new scoreboard for the gym. That's it. That's all it takes to win the affection of these losers. Whitey tries to take it like a champ, but he's obviously heartbroken and leaves with Eleanor. Davey crashes the dinner and tries to reason with him, but is shouted down by the mob, who couldn't care less about how Whitey feels. Why would we give Whitey Duval the patch so he could use it as a blanket? <laughs> Unsatisfied with his answer, Davy launches into a show-stopping diss track titled Bum Biddy, a traditional Jewish dance song describing how awful everyone is for hating on Whitey. So let me get this straight. It took these assholes 35 years to recognize the efforts of a man who's been volunteering since the early 80s, and they only start thinking about the consequences of their actions after being shamed by the town drunk via song? They were all so casual about being douchebags to him before, and now, only now, during a group dance sequence, do they understand that other people have feelings too. Elsewhere, Whitey retreats to the only place that makes him happy, and more importantly, the only real house of worship in town, the mall. <laughs> yeah, I feel super gross saying that, but it's true.
Why? Whitey always goes to the mall to find some sense of purpose when life keeps him down. He even talks to the mall. Like he's saying prayers to God. Like I get it's a joke, but I genuinely hate this movie. It's so unbelievably cynical and cruel. How needlessly tragic is it for an old man to find more personal comfort and less judgment by window shopping than from actually interacting with the other people in town? Fighting back tears, Whitey is so distraught that he admits he wants to leave town and move to Florida with Eleanor. But suddenly, Davy shows up with the rest of the townsfolk, who apologize for being so neglectful and give their own patches to Whitey to make up for the damage they had caused. Eleanor starts aggressively shipping Davy and Jennifer, making them hold hands because they're boyfriend girlfriend now, I guess? Then Whitey has a joy-induced seizure because apparently he can't have one single positive interaction before the movie ends. In the ultimate bait and switch, A Crazy Night was prominently advertised with the Hanukkah song playing over the trailer, but it is only used once the credits start to roll. So, even the song Adam Sandler based the title of this movie on becomes a last minute footnote. It is the one time you're expecting to do a dance party ending, and you don't do it? Oh. oh, by the way, folks, I got new merch. I guess this is what the kids call a merch drop. We got a boomer! Did I use that term right? Hopefully. Yeah, this is like the first official one. I've done like some t-shirts before, but look at this. That's official. You got the Saberverse poster. You got a beanie with my face on it. You got my mug on the mug. T-shirts, long sleeve shirts, Sabi Spark. The whole gang is here. So if you want to support the channel, go hit up the link in the description down below. Again, I really appreciate the support. Go check it out. Okay, let's get into my overall thoughts. This movie sucks, like really, really sucks. Eight Crazy Nights is a testament to everything wrong with Adam Sandler's worst movies. It's both a colossal waste of money and a case study of squandered talent. Upon its theatrical release, Eight Crazy Nights bombed commercially, panned by critics and hated by audiences. This particular quote from a review in Variety by writer Scott Fundus stuck out to me about not only how it was made, but why. Eight Crazy Nights is the closest a Sandler pick has come to the essence of the actor-comedian's persona. It's a highly expressive personal art piece, a vanity project without vanity, that only someone at the top of the Hollywood food chain could get studio money to make." End quote. And that's the real issue here. By far, the biggest issue with Eight Crazy Nights is the terrible script and the production company Happy Madison. If this movie had any other development team, but the same animation crew and orchestration, I could have seen this becoming another holiday classic. Because everybody who truly cared about making it something special wasn't in the writer's room. And oh my god, does it show. Despite getting a high-profile directorial credit under his belt, the film's director, Seth Kearsley, is acutely aware of just how toxic the lasting reputation of Eight Crazy Nights is. I've had a rocky relationship with the movie over the years. It was a big boost to my career, and then it was like an albatross around my neck. I didn't take the failure of the movie well." End quote. And that's a bummer, but I totally get what he means. I genuinely think that the majority of the crew did the best they could, even though they were given nothing to work with. After all, there's only so much polish you can put on a turd. The quality of the animation is by far the most redeeming or memorable aspect of the film. But it also actively pisses you off while you watch it. Like I was sitting there, staring at the TV, feeling dumbfounded and angry. I wanted to appreciate how fluid and gorgeous the animation was. But at the same time, I had to avert my eyes at the disgusting sight gags and cringe at how spiteful the tone is. I really hope the visual art and orchestral music team was paid well for their time. Because the animation, storyboarding, musical score, and direction is so much better than this movie deserves. You can tell a tremendous amount of energy and talent was wasted trying to bring this movie to life. But don't let that dissuade you from checking out the work of the other creators involved with making it. Seth Kearsley went on to work on the underrated Looney Tunes show that was blowing up a few years back. You know, uh, the one where Lola Bunny has an actual personality? Yeah, that one. It's excellent. He understood the assignment, that show rules. He was also the writer, producer, and director of a brief but unproduced animated pilot made for Kingdom Hearts. It was originally considered lost media, but has since been re-uploaded onto YouTube. 
There are crossover fandom stickers available on his website, like Whitey dressed as Sora, which is genuinely hilarious. Glad to see he can laugh at himself and embrace the meme. In my research, I did a bit more digging online and found something surprising. An article by writer Les Carpenter on TraditionalAnimation.com, who had conducted an interview with Seth celebrating the 20th anniversary of the film. In it, the director shines a light onto further details surrounding their trouble production, specifically from upper management. Quote, There were almost two different phases of the movie. There was one with the executive producer, who started the project, and a whole other with the executive producer who finished the film. The first was a nightmare and didn't know what he was doing, and I was seriously concerned that it was going to get shut down. He had a ridiculous schedule that treated it like a straight-to-video. When he was removed, the budget was raised, and the schedule was lengthened. It was still only $34 million in two years, so it's not like it was luxury, but it gave us enough time to do something nice. Along with its uphill battle, there was also a lot of interference from focus groups regarding the shitting deer and Whitey's voice. So even though people hated hearing Whitey's voice, the studio kept it in anyway, rather than redub it over. The animation production itself was split up between a staggering 11 different animation production houses in order to stick within this two-year deadline. Because of his TV pipeline work history, Seth managed the team remotely from LA quite easily, receiving their dailies with few issues. A Crazy Nights is a pretty short movie, only running 76 minutes with credits. But that's still a very aggressive schedule for any animated feature built mostly off its star power. Circling back, was there anything specific that I liked about it? Um, I like this joke with the deer, I guess. Yeah, that's pretty much it. A Crazy Nights goes well out of its way to make nearly all of the characters weird, mean, and annoying. Whitey and Eleanor do their best to look out for each other and have some nice moments together, but that's not good enough. They're both still treated as the town's punching bags for just being weird. As a protagonist, Davy is so unlikable and harsh that nobody should waste any time having to put up with him. To me, there is a fine art to making unlikable main characters. They have to have a compelling motivation or reason for us to care about why they're going down a specific path to make them interesting. They can be bad people who make terrible decisions, but we should have a reason to understand what they're doing and why we should be emotionally invested in them. And it's just not there in this movie. Davy's change of heart near the end of the film is completely contrived and unearned because it's a holiday movie and damn it, we need to have a happy ending. No excuses. Due to his business savvy, Adam Sandler rapidly became one of the most bankable stars in Hollywood around the new millennium. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Millennium. His 1990 film, Big Daddy, was a massive financial success, grossing nearly $235 million against a $34 million budget. After that, Sandler's standard pay rate with Sony Pictures allegedly shot up from $8 million per film to a whopping $20 million per film, plus 20-25% to of the gross profits from the release. Knowing this, it makes sense how his broad style of humor and every man like ability has become a unique brand, and why the movies from Happy Madison seem to keep making so much money for Sony. It's a divisive strategy though. Often your enjoyment of these movies is directly related to how much you personally like Adam Sandler as a performer. He can deliver a performance alright, but often it's the same one over and over again. Nothing challenging, new, or unique. Just reliable grossed out jokes and goofy antics to gawk at for 90 minutes. In my opinion, Adam Sandler can waste his own time and Sony's money on ugly live-action films to go on his elaborate work trips with his old SNL friends. That's his prerogative, I guess. But not at the expense of a bunch of struggling artists in a rapidly dissolving hand-drawn animation industry forced to make deer-looking poop off an old frozen man's face. Why did this story need to be told? Genuinely, I need answers, some kind of explanation to make this disaster make sense. What's even worse is that Adam Sandler can bring his A-game when the script is solid. Case in point, Paul Thomas Anderson's Punch Drunk Love came out the exact same year as A Crazy Nights and showcased his genuine talent as a serious actor. Portraying the repressed but sincere toilet plunger salesman Barry Egan, Sandler was widely praised for his performance.
performance by critics and fans alike. It broke through his reputation of being seen as just a comedic actor, similar to what The Truman Show did for Jim Carrey a few years earlier. Sandler later received an award for Best Actor from the 2002 Guy John International Film Festival held in Spain, not to mention a Best Actor nomination at the Golden Globes. But that film's release was directly followed by both A Crazy Nights and The Hot Chick, two of the worst reviewed movies released under the Happy Medicine brand at the time. It's not just that this movie is gross and mean-spirited, it's also a shitty Hanukkah movie. Like bad Christmas movies are a dime a dozen, it's a popular, highly marketable holiday with a bunch of iconic characters and activities that anybody could shoehorn into a movie. But to make a bad Hanukkah movie? Now that takes some serious intervention. Sure, there's some Jewish iconography around the town, like the giant menorah eye sculpture at the community center, but these depictions are completely superficial with none of them doing anything to bolster the plot. There are three extremely brief references I'll mention here, just to give you an idea of how limited the depictions of Hanukkah were in this movie. Here's one shot in the opening of a faceless man lighting the first candle on a Hanukkah menorah, one shot of Davy interrupting some kids playing dreidel, and another shot of a man dropping a lot keys in the snow. That's pretty much it. But yes, all of those three things, roughly 15 seconds. And they're all situations involving background characters who have no emotional stakes in the main plot. Jennifer's son Benjamin briefly talks about the gifts he got on the previous night, but it's mostly throwaway pieces of dialogue used to fill time. And honestly, that was really surprising to me. I went into it wanting to know more about what makes Hanukkah a unique and memorable holiday, but mostly I ended up with more questions than I had at the start. Like, don't get me wrong, I know why they're doing it. Christmas can be an overwhelming, flashy, and obnoxious holiday depending on how people celebrate it. There's a ton of crappy Christmas movies that make that a point of contention, like Christmas with the Cranks or Deck the Halls. The characters in those movies use Christmas as a holly jolly shield to excuse their own awful behavior or bully other people into celebrating their way. But that joke gets lost in the ether when they don't use the film to show how enjoyable Hanukkah can be. So when compared to that, Hanukkah is bound to feel understated and drowned out. It's not a high holiday like Yom Kippur, but it's supposed to be a fun, festive time to hang out with your family and friends just like Christmas. Frankly, I've seen better positive representation in a few Lifetime movies than in Eight Crazy Nights. Sure, the bar is pretty low going in, but you at least have to try to give it some kind of cultural relevance. If you have the opportunity to show how important your own heritage and traditions are to you in a feature-length film, then maybe don't cloak it in jokes about deer-eating shit and mocking the elderly. I don't know why that needs to be said, but I guess Adam Sandler and his production company have to be told that. There's a fragment of a good narrative buried in here. That is if you're willing to sift through enough crap to find it. But the story we ended up with was so nasty and half-baked that it brings down everything else around it. The instrumentation on the songs and the original soundtrack are good. The layout and color direction is visually striking. The hand-drawn animation is beautiful and incredibly fluid. Why couldn't they be used on a better film? Huh, they were actually. It was called The Iron Giant. While now widely regarded as a cult classic masterpiece, its initial release was a commercial failure, only grossing $31 million against a $50 million budget. This led to massive layoffs at Warner Brothers Feature Animation, with many of their top 2D artists coming to work on this film afterwards. You can actually tell by comparing how similar the deer look in both movies. Uh, you know, minus the turds, obviously. One of these things is definitely not like the other. Eight Crazy Nights is the definition of a job is a job. At a time when CGI animation was starting to bridge the gap in developing marketable feature animation towards adults, Happy Madison opted to make a traditionally animated Hanukkah special that is disgusting and borderline unwatchable. That's become the legacy of Eight Crazy Nights today. It's the only full-length animated Hanukkah special we have, but it's also by far the worst one. I don't think Adam Sandler and his cronies can do better than this, but I'm certain somebody else could. This is one holiday film subgenre that could really use some competition. There are more respectful depictions about Hanukkah to check out this season, but most of them are admittedly pretty short, usually one 22-minute episode. If you want to check out a few that actually gives the holiday some positive attention, 
Just do yourself a favor and watch the Rugrats Chanika special, or the As Told by Ginger, Even Stephen Holiday special, or if you're looking for a bit more edge and adult-oriented humor, the Hebrew Hammer. Anything but this. This year is the 21st anniversary of the film's release. And yeah, trust me, I'm going to be doing a lot of drinking to forget it. Bartender! Another eggnog! I'll be needing it for my next Christmas crap review.